All right, Prof, we will start now. Okay, well, good uh, morning or good afternoon, everyone, depending on which continent you're on. I'm delighted to have this, um, this masterclass and this information session with you. Today, I'm going to be sharing my screen. A second. There you go. All right. Hopefully you can all see my screen now. So the, uh, the topic of today's masterclass, uh, I believe you're going to hear from uh, a lot more in the coming months and in the coming years. It's the parallel between digital and sustainability transformation, digital and sustainability leadership. Uh, it seems that somehow the world is moving from one paradigm to the other. And this is uh, what I'm going to talk to you about today. Don't hesitate to ask questions um, in the Q&R uh, uh, panel. Uh, I'll, I'm, I'll gladly uh, take them as we go, uh, or we'll have, we should have enough time at the end of the session to, uh, uh, to answer any question you may have. So the, the thing about, about this change is that we've basically finished a full decade of digital transformation. It's not entirely finished, actually. I'll, I'll talk about it uh, in a second. But it was full on for 10 years. It was the topic uh, that most organizations were talking about. Um, and leaders and organizations must now, must now face a new paradigm, which is sustainability transformation. Um, one of the questions is, how can sustainability transformation and sustainability leadership can build upon this age of digital, um, which uh, brought a lot to the table, which is still going to bring a lot to the table, uh, but also face uh, a deeper type of reinvention? Let's start with actually a little bit myself, so, uh, so you can feel that I'm a little bit legitimate on this topic. Um, so I've actually graduated from ESSEC uh, Business School about uh, 16 years ago, and then I immediately uh, moved on to a career in digital. Um, it was in 2006, and I was somewhat of a, a geek, passionate with digital business, uh, which only truly boomed in the 2010s. Um, and after that, uh, I progressively, in the 2010s, while I was still working in digital, in large tech companies, I actually had uh, two major epiphanies. The first one was around education. Um, I, I realized that this is something I really got a, a kick out of, um, and, and, and growing people was something that I, that I uh, particularly enjoyed. And so I was, um, I was able to start teaching at ESSEC, and, and, and most importantly, I was uh, given the reins of a chair at ESSEC called Digital Disruption, which I was, the, which I was in charge of for uh, many years. Um, the goal was mainly to train future chief digital officers. Uh, and then second major epiphany that I had in the last decade was around environments. My, my point of entry into the complex world of, of environment, um, I would say was to become an activist for animal rights, uh, a topic that is, that is really dear to my heart. It's about, uh, it's about fair food, you know, fair for the farmers, but also for the animals. Um, it's about good food, uh, you know, starting to, to, to spread organic food. It's about climate food. Um, eating local and not eating animals actually has uh, a huge impact on the climate. And, and then beyond this topic, I progressively discovered the complexity of the world of, of sustainability, uh, which brings me uh, here today. And I'll, I'll present to you the, the MSC in STEMT transformation later on. Today, what I'm doing is designing programs and training students to, to students and managers, actually, because um, I also work on executive education, to become future chief impact officers, CIOs or CSOs, chief sustainability officers, a term um, that is still quite recent that you'll, you'll hear more about uh, in the coming years, um, or sustainability consultants. So I would say these are the two main roles that uh, um, are really booming, have been booming for the last two years. 
and are going to continue to boom and, and for which companies and organizations are looking for talents, hopefully like, like you. One uh, last important piece of information I'd like to share about myself, my experience is that I've also worked on the intersection between digital and sustainability. A few years ago, um, after teaching digital strategy and digital marketing for a long time, I realized that we were only scratching the surface of all the fundamental questions that a lot of students were asking themselves. Uh, I created a course called Digital Humanism, uh, whose uh, pedagogical goal is to better gauge um, and readjust the space we give to digital technologies in our lives, in our companies, and in our societies. Uh, so it's about ethics, it's about geopolitics, uh, and, and so on. So that was a bit about myself. So digital transformation versus sustainability transformation. What are we talking about? Are these similar processes? Um, you know, where does, where does the parallel start? Where does it end? Uh, also in terms of sequence, uh, chronologically, um, how, is that, how is that exactly working? So as I mentioned, we've, we've finished an era, again, I, I, I need to correct myself. We haven't finished that era, but the, the, the booming phase of the era of digital transformation um, has, has finished. It's, it's, it's dwindling down uh, in some way. And we are entering an era of impact. Uh, quick parenthesis on, on, on the term impact. Sometimes you'll hear impact, sometimes you'll hear sustainability, sometimes you'll hear transition, especially in, in French. Um, Today is not the moment to talk about, uh, to do a, a course on semantics. These are this is a very interesting topic, but um, for matters of simplicity, I'm going to stick to sustainability, which in my view is the most uh, neutral, less polluted term. Uh, you may hear me talk about impact um, uh, here and there. Actually, impact is, for, is short for positive impact. Um, I agree that in terms of marketing, it's short for probably more impactful. Um, but I'll, I'll stick to sustainability uh, for now. So the thing about digital transformation, which, as I mentioned, really started booming uh, in the early 2010, is that this has been the promise essentially um, of a new world that is geared towards efficiency and greater comfort, right? Um, and the era is, is, as I mentioned, it's far from finished because organizations still need to go digital quite a lot. Recruiters are there, are still massively looking for digital talents, right? But it is getting more technical. Uh, it, it has uh, permeated within um, most organizations. Um, there used to be a lot of digital chief digital officers. There are less of them now, fewer of them, because digital is just about everywhere in a lot of companies. Uh, they've gotten there uh, for a lot of them, not all of them, but for, for a lot of them. Um, and also my take is that it's less, it has become less inspiring. Uh, it has become a bit business as usual. Um, in my view, the main stakes of digital today is to serve greater causes that digital for the sake of digital, right? Uh, digital needs to serve causes that are greater than itself. I see three possible causes uh, at the service of which digital technologies can, 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 be, uh, can be put. The first one is sustainability, clearly. Uh, I think the, the, the 2020s are going to be about a more sustainable digital. That's one thing. The other key topic in my view is about decentralization and democratization, how digital can actually help um, these, two, uh, these, two, uh, these two concepts, these two aspects of our societies. Um, and Web3, what we call Web3 is probably the best tool for that. Web3, meaning um, all the, the blockchain powered technologies like cryptocurrencies, are theoretically uh, meant to decentralize and democratize our societies. I'm not saying it's working, it has a lot of obstacles and it actually, might actually be going in the wrong direction for now, but that's the original objective. Um, and this is a, a cause that is greater than, than digital for the sake of digital. And the third uh, greater cause uh, for digital in my view in the, coming, in, the, in the decade that just opened is new narratives and, pos and, and, and possible futures. Uh, and the technologies uh, that are the, the, the strongest here 
um, in order to 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 allow this, uh, is probably the metaverse and the and the deployment of five G technologies. Metaverse and five G are going to hopefully open up our imagination, help build new narratives and and, and possible futures. But some of you here uh, who are a bit familiar with this uh, these topics. Uh, may already start to wonder whether this is not a bit of a naive uh, uh, vision. And clearly the reality is much more complex uh, and challenging uh, when it comes to, uh, to digital transformation in the next 10 years. Because again, sustainability, uh, decentralization and democratization with Web3 and new narratives and possible future with Metaverse and 5G, there's a lot of contradiction between these, these, three, um, these three causes, right? these three objectives. For instance, uh, sustainable digital is somewhat of an oxymoron, right? Uh, granted, IT can help curb climate change, you know, through efficiency uh, of technologies, but at the same time, CO2 emissions of digital technologies are growing exponentially, right? And, and um, if you take another example, blockchain and Ethereum in particular are trying to go greener, but if there's a massification of, of blockchain, it will result into what we call rebound effects. So again, more and more CO2 emissions. The same goes obviously for the metaverse and, and 5G, which uh, in essence, we can actually question um, the, the, the sustainable existence, right? Um, at least at this stage of development, a lot of experts, and, 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 and I would clearly side with these experts, see more downside, more uh, negative externalities to the deployment of 5G when it comes to sustainability than positive ones, right? There, there are going to be cases, business cases that should be positive, but with all the rebound effects uh, coming up with the usage of these technologies, right now it's, 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 rather, um, uh, it's rather mainly negative impact, right? So this is complex and hopefully digital is going to be a digital transformation in its new version um, is hopefully going to be uh, to be uh, growing alongside system T transformation and not against it, but uh, we still need to see where this is going to go. When it comes to sustainability transformation, it's just the beginning um, and it's much deeper. It's definitely much deeper. We're going to be talking about sustainability leadership and you'll discover how deep it is, but the final KPI here isn't comfort anymore. Right. It's I would I would say the main KPI, the main key performance indicator is shared happiness. Right. Digital was about maximizing comfort, you know, getting greater efficiency to maximize comfort. Sustainability is about maximizing shared happiness. And and the two words, the two keywords here are, are both important, uh, both equally important, shared and happiness. Right. It's not just not just the individual pursuit of happiness anymore. Unfortunately, two goals, comfort for digital and shared happiness for sustainability are contradicting each other a little bit, right? And the, the, the era that we've entered is really about choosing and about establishing a hierarchy, right? Um, between our individual comforts, and I want to say individual, it's also individual in terms of, you know, also one corporation, for instance, um, or is it about, you know, maximizing happiness for you know, the, the greater good and for the, the highest number of, of, of stakeholders. In any case, it's a civilizational challenge for humankind. But when it comes to, a, from a business standpoint, you know, if there's one thing to remember here is that one, one parroting digital transformation was about helping to make, it is about helping to make more money, while the other one, not so much, right? Uh, sustainability transformation, the promise, a lot of, People might tell you that you know uh, it will help uh, growth and in, in, in financial growth, but the reality, and we're getting there in terms of collective realization, the reality is it's probably going to be more about not losing money and understanding that money does not make you happy, right? Because at the end of the day, the KPI is not going to be about GDP anymore. It's not going to be about financial growth anymore. It's going to be about uh, shared happiness. So one helps make money, the other one, not so much, and, and, and that's a huge limit uh, when we think of the parallel and the similarities between these two types of paradigm, paradigms, digital transformation, sustainability transformation. You cannot go to a company today 
as a sustainability consultant and promise more efficiency for greater comfort for money. Right? It's going to be more efficiency for probably less revenue, but hopefully more shared happiness. So let's talk about digital leadership, right? I'm going to, to deep dive into these two types of leadership and, and, and draw parallel, uh, parallels between the two and also see how sustainability leadership can build upon digital leadership. Um, the, hopefully some of you may recognize the picture in the background. Don't hesitate to put it in the, in the chat. I'm, I'm just curious to see how familiar the audience is with the with the topic do we have anyone in the chat aware of what the picture is about for now we don't okay All right All right this is the apple park so that's the the headquarter so the headquarters of apple um in my view leadership um is about these four subtopics. Leadership is about strong vision. It's about what corporate culture do you promote? And it's about also what hard skills and what soft skills do you grow as a leader? And obviously you grow around yourself. So historically digital leadership, it stems, I mean, and, and there's no mystery here, it stems from large tech firms. Let me just check that. Yeah, I was just checking there was no, technical problems checking my phone it stems from large um, tech firms from california uh hence the apple park and then obviously it it um it spread to uh to startups uh which are not just in california obviously in which um is a is a culture in itself startup culture the vision of the digital leader clearly if i had to sum it up it's a capacity to inspire a technical vision of the stakes at hand. Technological, sorry, not technical. A technological vision of the stakes at hand. Technology and digital are seen as a solution to almost all problems. So there's a huge bias here, which is conscious. Um, if you take Google's mission statement, for instance, at least uh, the one that was used for, for two decades, organizing the world's information and making it universally accessible and useful, uh, this organization was obviously uh, happening through you know, a suite of, of uh, Google uh, technological tools. But also, most interestingly, at Google, there is um, an entity, actually not at Google, it's, it's the, the parent company now is Alphabet. Uh, at Alphabet, there's a very interesting entity called Google X, which has existed for some time now. And the goal of Google X was to solve the world's most complex issues through their technological vision by hiring the most, the smartest engineers uh, out there. From health issues to transport issues uh, to democratizing Wi-Fi in Africa, for instance, some of you may remember uh, the balloons that were, uh, the Wi-Fi balloons that were spread um, in, this, in, the, in the skies of uh, the stratosphere of, of uh, some African countries called Google Loon um, and, and many more projects uh, like that. That's That's the, and, at, and for a long time, this has been a very, very uh, inspiring vision for a lot of people, including uh, myself. Um, at Google X, uh, there, are, there are two concepts um, that are especially inspiring. Uh, one is called Moonshots. I mean, they haven't invented every, they haven't invented it, it has existed for a long time, but promoting the concept of Moonshot. You know, you, you really aim uh, for massive projects that are going to change uh, the, the surface of this planet and solve you know, uh, huge issues. The other one is called 10X. When you try and solve, um, you know, a, a big issue uh, like like democratizing uh, the internet uh, in in uh, on the African continent, you don't think in terms of uh, improving the situation by you know 10%. You try to improve the situation by you know a thousand uh, percent. Hence the 10X. Uh, actually, it should be 900%. Uh, hence the 10x term, uh, trying to, 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 to change things and to put ourselves in the mindset of changing things 10x. Um, and that's, that's very interesting uh, in a way because this vision inherently isn't humble. You know, it's, it's, uh, 
It's about believing that technology um, in a way is much, much, much stronger than everything we have invented uh, so far as a civilization. So that's, that's part of the vision uh, of, the, um, of the digital leader. Um, right now, I would say that Elon Musk is definitely the, the, the person that embodies that vision the best uh, with all the, you know, the, the positive and negatives that you could think about around his, uh, uh, his vision and his personality. When it comes to promoted culture, um, a lot of uh, key concepts here, that some of you may have heard of, may have experienced, hopefully, because this is becoming more and more widespread. First, I would say that uh, the promoted culture for, from, from uh, a digital leader is that of a matrix organization uh, and matrix management, meaning you, it's not vertical anymore, right? Now you don't just have like a boss above your head and that's it, and, or, and you manage people below you. It's about having dotted, what we call dotted line managers, hence the matrix organization. It's about management by influence. Uh, these are uh, key concepts. And, and for those of you who have never experienced it, um, you know, it's, uh, it's, uh, it can take a while to, to adopt, but it's definitely a, a vision that is continuing to, to spread. One other um, promoted part of the corporate culture uh, when it comes to digital leadership is flex office. Um, you know, the digital, digital, uh, digital first companies we're ready, we're more ready than the other ones for the COVID crisis and the confinement and the quarantines, right? Because this is something they already uh, had um, implemented a, a while back, the flex office and the video conferencing tools. More generally, um, uh, what is now being referred to as the startup culture, uh, I would say, is, uh, is what is being uh, uh, promoted. In a startup culture, you have uh, the culture of brainstorming, you have the culture of keeping your options open, uh, a lot. The objective uh, is definitely to empower and to autonomize um, employees, right? I, I would say these are this is the number one objective. For instance, at Google, uh, the hiring process, for instance, has always had as a primary objective because Google is a company with very few people. Uh, when you compare the the, the the revenue of the company, number of employees, uh, compared to a lot more uh, to to a lot of other companies in the same range of revenue, you have um, you have much fewer employees, right? It's more of a company of of servers than a company than than a company of employees, and so you need to have very very um, autonomous and empowered uh, employees, uh, and I that, I would say that's that's part of the of the promoted uh, corporate culture uh, in the digital transformation um, era. Uh, another objective, I would say, uh, which is secondary, but close second, is to make sure that um, whenever you're hiring someone um, to, to join your, your, your company or to join your digital team, uh, you want these people to, to have an edge. You want them to, uh, to fit that very modern mindset that your company is, is trying to, uh, to promote. Uh, at Google, for instance, they call it Googliness, uh, which ended up in a film called The Internship that some of you may have seen. It was, um, you know, it's almost 10 years old uh, now. Um, but the thing about this, this, this edge uh, of the startup uh, culture, I would say it has lost its way. In, 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 in many ways, it has lost its way. Um, the startup culture is more and more being caricatured, right? There's this... There's, there's this, um, this show called Silicon Valley, which is about uh, the caricature of, the, of, that, of that culture. Uh, a lot of people are growing distrustful uh, of, that, of that promoted culture. Um, one last aspect of the promoted culture is about excellence. Keep in mind that a startup is, in, is inherently about explosive growth. We're going to lend you a lot of money, but uh, the objectives that we're going to give you are going to be very, very difficult to meet. Uh, and if you don't meet them, you're probably going to have to go, uh, you're probably going to have to close your company within, within two years, right? You have to be the best, grow fast, and, and, and take the market very, very quickly, right? So that culture of excellence um, and that pressure of excellence is also part of the promoted corporate culture. These companies, the GAFAMs, are only looking for the best talents out there, and they have the, the financial means to do so, right? So that's, that's also part of the of the culture. 
When it comes to the skills, the hard skills of a digital leader, uh, I would say it's about continuously uh, training oneself. Uh, a, a digital leader must stay in touch with the latest technological solutions out there without necessarily becoming an expert of it. Uh, you know, you, you, you're an engineer, you start, uh, you start coding, and then, you know, after a few years of career, maybe uh, you're going to, to move to product management, um, you're going to be uh, managing engineers, but you're not going to be able to code the latest, uh, you know, uh, fancy language anymore. Um, and the same goes on the business side of things. Uh, what matters is that you understand, um, you know, the evolution of coding, the evolution of data management, um, and so on and so forth. But you don't. You need to understand the underlying stakes, but you don't need to be an expert uh, at it. So this continuous training until a certain limit, right? Um, some of the hard skills obviously comprise uh, design, uh, understanding the, the the various frameworks, design thinking, data management, digital marketing, uh, growth hacking within digital marketing has been a, a, a booming um, trend and, and necessary hard skill to, uh, to try to, uh, to master. Um, obviously having uh, a minimum of background around cybersecurity, around IoT, Internet of Things, and so on. Um, and the main difficulty, again, uh, remaining to continuously manage to train yourself. And you have to rely on HR, obviously, uh, for that. Uh, HR and, and digital first companies are really strong on this uh, on this topic. Uh, but mainly, I would say, uh, when it comes to the the main hard skill of a digital leader, is that that capacity to con continuously measure the impact of, it, of his his or her activities, continuously track everything that is being implemented, uh, because leader, digital leadership is very rational, right? It is and at the origin, it is very edge driven. Uh, and because of this, tracking measurement uh, is absolutely key here. And, and growing the, 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 this measurement skills and that mindset also um, is critical. When it comes to soft skills, um, I would say the soft skills of a digital leader, I would say it's mainly about agility, right? Uh, the era of digital transformation has forced organizations to, uh, to be able to, uh, to be much more flexible and to bounce back and, you know, and, and, and change objectives very rapidly, continuously train uh, employees. All of this require, for a digital leader, requires one key soft skill, which is agility. Uh, a few other um, soft skills I would say is that I would say that um, uh, the, the transparency of, of giving and receiving feedback, uh, that's a very, very difficult soft skill to acquire. Right. It really sometimes speaks to, uh, to, um, to our, our, our deepest uh, personality uh, traits. It's not always easy for everyone. Um, the thing about digital culture is that it's very fact-based. Uh, it's very edge-driven. So that culture of transparency, um, in a lot of cases, is easier. You know, for, for some reason, and I've witnessed it, uh, culture of engineers can be more, um, more direct. Uh, and the way they interact, sometimes a little too direct and, and maybe not diplomatic enough. But that, 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 that self skill of being able to manage uh, feedback and 360 degree feedback, where right? you also receive feedback from your own team uh, and from your dotted line reportees and managers um, is, uh, is a key one here. Looking at time. And so moving on to sustainability leadership. So, um, I'm going to, oh, let's see that we have comment. Okay, that was just a, that was just a hello message. So maybe some of you here uh, in, this, um, in this masterclass know the person here in the background picture. Um, actually, I'm going to ask the question. Anyone knows who that is? Ah. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Ivona. Yeah, the leader of Patagonia. It's, this is the CEO of Patagonia, Yvon Chouina, who just recently decided to basically, well, I'll sum it up, it's a little more complicated, but uh, give away his company for climate change, to fight climate change. Uh, basically give away the vast majority of his company to build an NGO that will actually uh, fight climate change. 
um, and I was discussing it with, with students and colleagues. And the question was, why aren't all leaders sustainable sustainability leaders like Igor Shulman? How come we're not here yet, right? We have, I would say, a few years to get there. Hopefully within a generation, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll have entirely gotten there. That's the type of, of leaders uh, the vast majority of large companies will have. But it's going to take uh, you know, some, some, some time to, to get there. So what is the vision of a sustainability leader? Um, well, first, keep in mind, this is all quite new, right? Uh, in, in my, and when I say quite new, I mean that there, there is still very little literature about it uh, going around. Uh, research um, is, is starting to, uh, to, 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 to write a lot about these type of topics, but uh, this is just the beginning of the era. And I would say, um, at least of the democratization of, of, of uh, sustainability. So the, the beginning of uh, uh, the sustainability transformation era. Um, I would say one thing is about transcending, uh, a capacity to transcend uh, your company's objectives uh, to accompany all stakeholders around you. Um, and it, it's really about uh, starting to enlarge your, your horizons. One example that I'm going to take is something called uh, scope three. So when we talk about carbon footprint, I'm not gonna give a class on carbon footprint here. Uh, if you do join a, a MSC Instantity Transformation, that's something we'll deep dive into. But when it comes to carbon footprint, uh, most companies out there focus on what is called scope one and scope two, meaning the direct emissions um, that the uh, CO2 and, and, and equivalent that they, that they emit uh, and the emissions of the, uh, their energy providers. Um, but at the end of the day, scope three in 99% of the time is what matters the most. And they've barely started to scratch the surface here because these are indirect emissions. Um, and indirect emissions is about starting to, to widen your horizons and, and realizing that, you know, as a company, especially as a large organization, you have massive clouds on your suppliers is what is called scope three, three A upstream. And you have a massive impact on your clients, what is called uh, scope three B downstream. Um, and, you know, starting to think about ways you can accompany your suppliers to uh, to be uh, more sustainable and to to have a uh, to lower the carbon footprint um, requires you know a strong strategy and vision. And doing so for your clients is even harder because sometimes it means selling less products. Uh, this is what Patagonia has been doing uh, for a long time. But 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 keeping in mind all of your stakeholders uh, is a new it's a new vision, it's a new way of seeing things. And it takes time to train this type of, of leaders. Um, there's a, an Indian guru that I like to quote, uh, whose uh, yoga courses I've been following for a few years, uh, someone called Sadhguru, uh, who's becoming world famous, could be seen as a bit controversial in India from what I hear here, here and there, which is not so, so much a topic. But what I like about uh, one of the things he preaches is that uh, he's trying to, to grow uh, yogis on, on, on the idea that their responsibility is limitless. And I really like that sentence, my responsibility is limitless. Realizing that, you know, it's, we've, we've entered an era where the, the social divides um, and the uh, environmental issues are so high that as leaders, we need to stop finding excuses for ourselves and for our organizations. And we need to start realizing or are, are, are assuming that we can continuously increase our sphere of responsibility. We can continue to increase it. And actually it's exciting to imagine that you can continue to increase your sphere of responsibility. You could always do more. You can always like be more inclusive, think of more stakeholders, right? And without obviously losing money, right? The, the, as I mentioned earlier, it's not going to be about you know, growing uh, financially anymore so much, but obviously it's not about losing too much money, obviously. It's about like shifting mindset towards another objective without losing money. 
So realizing that you could always, one as a leader can increase their sphere of responsibility because everything is interconnected uh, is part of that, of that vision. And in that sense, uh, coming back to the parallel between uh, digital leadership and sustainability leadership, technology, uh, as you've become to understand, has his, its pros and cons, right? Uh, as I mentioned, it, it should be put at the, at the service of a, of a greater cause, but the sustainable leader knows when to use technology or when not to use it because uh, you know, it, it's going to have unpredictable negative externalities. The promoted corporate culture, I would say, for, uh, for, uh, that is promoted by a sustainability leader is to put human beings back at the center. And the main risk here, well, before I talk about the risk, the, the thing is about if you want to put the human being uh, back at the center, um, there's also the notion of inclusive uh, inclusivity uh, that is absolutely uh, key here. How do you make sure that obviously everyone within your company in, in, in all the complexities of their personality traits and skills can feel included uh, in the overall objective of your company and also be beyond obviously your company, right? Again, coming back to that, that share, uh, that, that uh, stakeholder um, aspect of things. So, so promoting that, that, that inclusive culture. Uh, the difficulty though, when you, when you say that is that it immediately sounds like greenwashing. You, uh, there's a huge risk of greenwashing because you, you don't just promote that you're going to be putting uh, human beings uh, at the center. It requires a lot of uh, personal change, personal uh, epiphanies to have, to have happened uh, within the leadership of your companies, the, within the, the heart of the individuals of, of, uh, of the, the leadership of your, of your company, right? Um, so many companies out there uh, claim, you know, that, that, that they're putting human back at the center and, and not much is happening. And, and more than just the fact that not much is happening, the, um, the feedback, the official, the unofficial feedback that you're getting from the, from, you know, about the vibe of these companies is that uh, it's still quite uh, inhuman in, in many ways. So, uh, but that's, that is touching on to responsible communication, responsible marketing, which is another topic, which actually I'm teaching. Um, but these companies, you know, they, they should realize, uh, and especially the, the sustainability leaders should realize that uh, it's going to take a few years to put human uh, beings back at the center and they should not communicate it about it too early. Uh, otherwise, uh, obviously, uh, we're going to get to that, that, uh, that greenwashing uh, issue. Um, I want to also mention the fact when it comes to promoted company culture that this is, in a way, opposed to the startup culture. Right? The, the issue, and I was mentioning the fact that the startup culture was becoming more and more caricatured and, and a little mocked uh, in, some, in some way. The issue with the, the startup culture is that it is in, uh, in area, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, inherently built towards hyper growth. And if you build something uh, upon hyper growth, you're going to need to put pressure and pressure on your employees, right? And I'm not saying that we shouldn't have startups and we shouldn't uh, leverage this model, this, this corporate model, because it can bring um, a lot of innovation on the table. And we're going to need large startups to make economies of scale uh, in many, many ways to solve some of the, the world's uh, issues. But uh, the way it works, the fact that it's the startup at the end of the day, is, it's a hyper growth financial structure. That's what it's about. Um, moving on from like a technological um, uh, vibe to more of a financial vibe, uh, the startups in the, in the last few, uh, few years. Uh, it is a bit, it is, it, is, it is quite different and I would say opposed to, that, to that, that, that culture of putting human back in the center. It doesn't mean that, you know, balance cannot be found between excellence and pressure and like keeping human at the center, but it's a bit of, a, of an oxymoron, as I mentioned uh, a bit earlier. Um, when it comes to hard skills, same thing as digital leadership, agility is going to be, oh no, agility, sorry, switch soft skills. 
Um, but self-training, continuously training oneself uh, is going to be key here because the stakes are just as technical as the digital stakes, right? Uh, and both on the environmental side of things and the social side of things. Um, social sciences, measuring your social impact uh, is, is quite difficult. Um, in, in a way, it's less fact-based and, and making it fact-based is, is quite difficult. Uh, on the environmental side of things, um, you might think that, that measuring your carbon footprint is difficult. And this is actually the easiest thing uh, that can be done because that's the one thing that uh, um, our, our states and governments and companies have been starting to do for the last decade or so. Um, it becomes much more difficult when you try to assess um, your overall environmental footprint on water, uh, obviously on wood, on biodiversity, and, and so on. So it's quite technical and it requires uh, continuous training to uh, um, to get up to speed with uh, with this and, and to grow, to master this, this type of hard skill. Impact measurement, as I mentioned, remains key. We live in a capitalist world and we need to be able to measure the impact um, of our endeavors, of our, of our projects. Um, and it's by over-investing on impact measurement, then the sustainability leader is going to impose his vision to his organization and to the world, right? Being able to clearly measure things is going to help promote that culture, that vision. Um, I'm going to be uh, using one uh, interesting example. I was I'm, I'm one of the big European unicorns, so big scale up, uh, is actually a partner of um, the MSC in Sustainability Transformation. Uh, it's called, uh, well, actually, I'm not going to, to, to mention it. I don't want to, uh, to give you too much of their of their strategy, but one of the um, one of the main objectives for them um, when it comes to, um, to sustainability transformation, um, obviously, is to measure uh, their carbon footprint. And, and it's a technological company, and it's about servers and where do the servers sit, what is the type of energy uh, that is being uh, used there. But what what I like about it is that. The, the spectrum of the topics that they're tackling is much, much wider than just carbon footprint. For instance, when it comes to um, promoting an inclusive uh, um, mindset and culture, they, they have grown so much in the last year that one, one risk is for them to start getting canceled. Uh, hopefully a lot of you know about the cancel culture uh, that has started um, happening in, in the US. Um, if there's any scandal uh, around, I don't know, uh, harassment, um, you know, um, lack of inclusion at work, um, um, issues with the recruitment process around diversity, you know, this could backfire into such a communication crisis that this could have, uh, this could lead to uh, a risk of, of your company getting canceled uh, in, the, in the corporate space, meaning that all of a sudden, no one will want to work for you. Right, you're 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 a black sheep. I don't like that metaphor, but um, because because of the way it portrays Adam, the, the the sheep. But but still, that works in in that case. So um, that's also what's interesting about about the hard skills is that it's so complex, and you have to train yourself on so many of these topics. At the end of the day, we all start with one topic, right? I've started with, as I mentioned, the animal cause, and then food transition. And then moving on to environmental transition as environmental transition as a whole, and then moving on to something even bigger, which is sustainability, which includes social aspects as well, which which is left where I'm coming from. Uh, but we all start with like one topic of preference or, or expertise. Uh, so I mentioned animal cause and foods. In, 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 as for me, there's also responsible marketing, uh, which is something that I can rely on quite a lot because this is one topic that I've been. Um, digging for a long time. Um, and finally, soft skills. That's probably the most essential part here. Uh, so it's good that we're going to conclude on this. A good uh, sustainability leader has to start a very heavy work of introspection. Otherwise, they're going to get into greenwashing. I mentioned that, right? 
Um, and this means that a sustainability leader needs to start thinking about the concepts of uh, getting, being attached to things, being able to let go, obviously, uh, of things, what they, considered, uh, what they considered to be wealth and what they considered to not be wealth. Um, they need to start thinking about their own psychological biases, right? We've, we, we are all conditioned human beings and it's difficult to decondition, to, 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 uh, to deconstruct all of these biases. Uh, it can be very, very uh, scary also at times when you realize that everything that you've, you've built was built with, a, with biases that you were not even conscious of. Um, and, and I would say the digital, the sustainability leader also needs to, to put his own career in perspective with durability of his company, right? Uh, of his company, um, of his planet, and of human beings, right? How necessary am I? How, is, how necessary my presence is at the head of this team, at the head of this company? Um, if I stay here, am I going to be able to shift that company uh, to, to a more positive impact for the planet or for human beings or not? Should I just let go of this company and actually move to another type of organization, organization where I can have a larger impact, for instance? Uh, these are all like super complex questions that we're seeing more and more. Like people are ready to leave their job. You may have heard about the big quit uh, phenomenon that happened uh, in the Anglo-Saxon, that started with the Anglo-Saxon world uh, after uh, this period of quarantine that we all went through. And one of the consequences, one of the causes, one of the roots of the big quit is looking for more meaning at work, uh, right? And, and if you can find it at work and if you feel like you can have an impact with an organization and, 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 and with the, sh the stakeholders around you, Obviously, this may push you to stay, um, but but it's 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 very very difficult. One of the things to solve is one's own cognitive dissonances. Um, so that's a concept um, some of you may may be aware of or not. Uh, a cognitive dissonance is when there's a gap between your values and your actions, right? Um, I'm not going again to give the the name of that company, but. Uh, a very large French company uh, came to a sec uh, a year and a half ago. Uh, we, we had the head of CSR, actually, um, the head of sustainability coming, who's a former ASEC. And she was telling us that the, the CEO of the company had switched to an electric car in order to, you know, to, to move around and to meet uh, stakeholders and, and employees uh, from, uh, in France. And the... Um, it was becoming too difficult. Uh, it was, it was um, the, the CEO was losing time, you know, was recharging the car and so on. And so they had to move back to, you know, a, a, um, a gas powered SUV. And she was telling me at the end of the day, the impact of the CEO is not going to be about, you know, what is the type of vehicle he drives, you know, it's going to be about the strategy that he puts forward for the company. And uh, I disagreed, the student disagreed, because at the end of the day, um, there's an emergency to be more consistent. Uh, if you start as a sustainability leader, if you start solving as many of your own cognitive dissonances, you're going to be able to root your vision in a much deeper way for your company, for the stakeholders around you, for your managers and your employees, right? Uh, and there are lots of cognitive dissonances when it comes to individuals, you know, it's about uh, it's about cars, it's about planes, it's about eating meat, uh, it's about, you know, heating a huge apartment uh, or house, you know, these are, you know, wh when we're looking for uh, minimizing our, our, our impact, these are uh, obviously disordances that, that need to be solved. Uh, I don't mean that everybody should become minimalist in the way they live, but growing conscious of that and trying to, to grow, um, uh, on, on all of these uh, subtopics in order to solve, start solving this, this, this dissonances is going to be key for, for consistency, sakes of consistency. Uh, for the interest of time, I had a lot of more examples. Um, yeah, I'm going to just uh, mention one and then we'll finish with, uh, with one, one or two other soft skills. One other example is um, the, um, 
I got in touch with the, recently with the, the, the financial director of a large FMCG company. And that person got in touch with me because he had become uh, uh, very much aware of sustainability stakes and the emergency of, of, of moving, helping to move his company towards um, a more sustainable future. And actually he has become a finance and sustainability director, uh, which you're going to see more and more in a lot of organization because you know finance uh, at the end of the day is what rules the world. And it's not, it can be a very smart move to give the sustainability power to uh, the finance guys um, in a company. You have to make sure that they, they, they really take it to heart. Uh, so this is definitely a, a trainings to be led and, and ensuring that we have strong sustainability leadership there. Um, but it, it, it's definitely an interesting, an interesting choice. And his first question where, and it, it loops back to the beginning of my presentation, what are, um, what were your personal epiphanies around sustainability? What is your personal uh, story with sustainability? And in his case, he went through his children. Right. He had children and then he realized that he had to stop uh, the way he had been working uh, until then. He had to, to, to start having a positive impact uh, around himself. That's, that, it's, often, it's often the case, right? The, the, the birth of children is going to be, to be fundamentally uh, shifting the gears uh, within the, the mind and the heart of a, of a leader. And the reason why I'm telling this story is that more and more, um, there's going to be uh, a question of how do you story tell yourself? Um, that's, that's, that's important. And also a growing mix between your personal life and your corporate life. You know, there's a need for alignment between personal life and, and corporate life. The, the last uh, two or three soft skills uh, that I'd like to mention, um, I mentioned agility uh, for the digital leadership. Agility here, uh, I think I already mentioned that obviously is going to be a key um, again and again, being able to, uh, to bounce back, to, to change objectives uh, and, and to, to be okay and actually to be excited that the permanent change uh, is going to be needed. Resilience, we talk a lot about resilience. We talk a little too much about resilience. Uh, it's not that simple to grow, uh, but resilience is absolutely key here because um, obviously the, all the companies out there are going to be, a lot of them are going to be losing money uh, with the fact that, uh, you know, a lot of uh, recession is being announced uh, in, in many countries and the fact that our growth has been paired with uh, extractivism. Uh, we're going to be able, we're not going to be able to, uh, to resort to fossil fuels anymore. We're not going to be able to resort to, uh, to rare earth metals uh, as much anymore. So there's going to be some type of degrowth, financial degrowth that a lot of organiza organizations and countries are going to be uh, undergoing. And how do, you, how do you get back to your original shape you know, without getting discouraged, right? This is resilience. And finally, diplomacy. A lot of you will have to face um, walls, right? If you get into the corporate world and the business world, trying to promote a sustainability culture and becoming a sustainability leader, you'll have to convince a great many people. And diplomacy uh, is absolutely key. You know, the, the, the caveat of diplomacy is being too slow in the way your company changed, but it, is, it, it remains the best approach. Uh, to, uh, to changing organizations and, and individual. And I will finish with one really, really uh, tough example, tough to digest and to, to even like fathom, um, is the fact that um, sustainability transformation and sustainability leadership may require from some sustainability leader to go as far as closing their company. That's the ultimate case. But if you think of the fact that a lot of companies out there are based, are heavily dependent on fossil fuel. You know, if you take airlines, for instance, um, and that beyond everything that you can read or hear, we are nowhere to finding uh, scalable solutions. The, the sustainability leader will, will, 
people, you know, if, if they're honest with themselves and with the reality around them, uh, and if they keep in mind, you know, all of the stakeholders around, one question may become, you know, okay, we're going to, this company is going to end at some, at some point. How do we plan this? How do we plan uh, the closing of the company so that, you know, there's, there's a, a smart uh, reattribution, reaffectation, uh, reemployment of uh, human resources, uh, of the, the buildings, uh, of the patents, uh, the brand, and so on, um, and, and shift all of this to, uh, to, uh, to, to other, other use. Um, that's the ultimate case, and that's what I'm going to uh, leave you with uh, for, this, for this masterclass. Thank you for your time on this. I'm going to be shifting without transition to a quick presentation of the MSC in sustainability transformation that we've launched at a sec. Hopefully you can still see my screen or maybe not actually, let me check. Yeah, I think I need to, yeah, no, it's good. Oh, thank you. Thank you. So I'm not gonna, the thing is that I'm not gonna talk about myself uh, here. Um, so at ESSEC Business School, what happened is that like a lot of business schools, especially in France, uh, in the last three, four years, um, we received, uh, and pardon, the, pardon, pardon my French, we received a nice kick in the in the butt. Um, in France, there's a, a big student movement called uh, movement for a uh, pour un réveil écologique for a uh, um, for a green awakening uh, that gathered tens of thousands of signatories uh, in order to push schools um, and and you know engineering schools, business schools, and so on uh, to 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 better prepare them for sustainability stakes. And, you know, uh, consider me um, honest or, 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 hum or honest or dishonest, humble or arrogant uh, as you like, but I feel that uh, ESSEC is doing a rather, a rather good job, a rather humble job has been doing so for the last few years now. Um, and, and, and it is part of its strategy. One of the three pillars of its strategy is actually to shift towards uh, a much more sustainable school, to shift to a transition school, if you will. And uh, this strategy is called Together. Uh, I'm not gonna give the details of it, but it's about making sure that all of the core courses um, comprise you know, uh, analysis of sustainability stakes, making sure that all of the students who get into the school from now on will have sufficient uh, sustainability training, making sure that our buildings uh, that our carbon footprint um, are in line with the Paris Agreement uh, from 2015, uh, COP21. For instance, we just announced uh, our reduction, um, our goal to reduce our carbon footprint by 25% by 2030, which mainly, which mainly stems from students flying, by the way. Uh, it's scope 3B that I mentioned earlier, um, and, and so on and so forth. Also the way we recruit students where uh, we've, we've instilled a lot more diversity in the last uh, two years. I could go on about this uh, as, as an ambassador um, of, this, of this topic, but what matters to me, what is dear to my heart is that I feel that the organization I'm working with um, is putting its money where its mouth is, right? There's some strong level of consistency and we're shifting the organization. It takes time, it's gonna to continue to take time. We're talking about a business school for Christ's sake, right? So obviously we're talking about the place where um, a lot of the great inventions of our economical models globally have been invented, but we're also going, talking about the place, business schools, where um, a lot of the, um, uh, of the reasons why we have strong sustainability issue as a civilization also um, have been born, right? Um, and so we need to change the way we teach everything. Uh, we need to, to take a step back and show different models and, and grow the sense of critical 
thinking uh, of students as, as, as much as possible. And then it's, it's up to them to choose like what is going to be their preferred path, whether they want to get into large organizations and, 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 and change things from within or whether they want to join NGOs or, or, or public organizations or create their own social or green startup, for instance, uh, and so on. The program that we launched, what's really interesting here is that, um, well, it's a one-year program. Um, and it is, um, it is based, it's been built upon a lot of the existing expertise of what is already the best at ESSEC uh, Business School. So a lot of professors, especially uh, in what we call chairs, have been working on sustainability topics for a long time with students, with academic research. And we decided to basically gather a lot of the expert, this expertise and to build a generalist program uh, around sustainability. When I say generalist, I mean that it's the, the main objective is to, is to grow what is heavily demanded by the market now. It, mean, it means not just like super, uh, super good experts, like, you know, such and such sustainability topics like carbon footprints or diversity, but, but, but expert of everything, expert of the whole breadth of topics around sustainability, you know, from understanding food transition, biodiversity, leadership, uh, and inclusion, circular, circular economy, uh, obviously uh, carbon footprint, um, uh, uh, sustainable, uh, sustainable finance, responsible marketing, and so on and so forth. And more generally, how do you build a sustainability strategy? Uh, the market is heavily demanding this type of generalists. And if you are, if you are hesitant to choose that type of career, you're getting there at the right time, right? At the beginning of that, of that, uh, that, that bell curve, right? Where uh, it, it is starting to boom on the market. The market demands these generalists. And the beauty of what we created is that we also, uh, we also allow students to choose a major, one of six possible majors in order to, at the end of the day, have a degree, which is a generalist degree around sustainability as to how you can transform organization but also have one extra expertise that you can value uh, on, your, on your resume, which I'm going to be talking about uh, in a second. Um, one other aspect, the third aspect here you can read on the slide is holistic approach. There is no growing sustainability talents um, by staying just at the mind level. Uh, we need to make sure that we take you on the field, on the ground, that's why we have up to three learning expeditions uh, just over one year. Um, and also the last aspect is heart. Um, as I mentioned earlier, when it comes to the soft skills of, of sustainability leadership, there's a, there's a dire need uh, to grow you know, resilience and to grow diplomacy. Um, and, and resilience because uh, you gotta be facing walls, it's gonna be difficult uh, obviously, to 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 change uh, the organizations you're going to be working with or you're going to be working around, um, and and diplomacy because you you'll need to to find that right balance between you know being soft and pushing, um, and that means that there's 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 a dire need to grow you know that sense of collective fight, collective uh, uh, cause. Um, if I was the head of a master's program in finance, I guess I wouldn't be writing this, right? Just, just to show you the difference. And finally, some radicality, um, that, that age, that era of impact that we've entered requires us to go back to the roots of the problems that we're facing. Radicality etymologically means uh, uh, going back to the roots. I'm not saying that we should be extreme. That's not the way I'm uh, intending this, this word. Um, I'm just saying that we need to revisit the roots of everything that was created. And, and that's, that, that, that sense of critical criticism uh, is one of the, the, key, um, the key things that we need to, we want to impart uh, for the students. So one year program, it's happening on our Sergi campus, our main campus in France. Uh, it has, and that's quite important, it has an accreditation from what is called Conférence des Grandes Écoles in France, which allows to give um, uh, visas to non-European students who would want to stay in Europe and, and, and work there. So that was, that, that was, that's critical to, uh, 
to mention. It's uh, taught in English. I mentioned uh, three learning expeditions. And it finishes with an internship uh, or professional experience, actually. It doesn't need to be internship. It could be actually a job. Um, and you can pick among six, six major to tailor the program. Uh, these are the two, um, the two uh, patterns that we had for the first class this year. Um, and that's what's interesting here is that they, they actually embody the two types of careers that you could think about. One is, um, is a career uh, within a large organization, actually a scale up in that, in that, in that sense, um, for that matter, Content Square. Um, so joining an impact team, a sustainability team. The other one is advising companies from the outside in as a sustainability consultant, right? And that's what uh, Florent Lyon and Capgemini Invent uh, are embodying. About the program structure, uh, and guys, don't hesitate to ask questions in the chat uh, right away if you have questions on this. I'm not going to dwell into too much detail here, otherwise it's going to be, um, I've already been talking for a long time and it's, it's going to start to be a, a little too heavy for everyone. Um, but the way we build the curriculum um, is, is, um, is, is as follows. First, uh, we have what we call the T0, it's the month of September when it's about starting to impart um, some knowledge on sustainability and some basics of management. This first month is key because it's also the month where uh, the class is going to be uh, turning into a cohesive group, right? So there's quite a few experiences uh, that the class is going through at this stage. Um, and one of the objectives is also to make sure that we, we try to put everyone on a level playing field when it comes to understanding sustainability uh, challenges. Not everyone is joining the program with the same type of knowledge. Uh, you know, some are joining with a finance bias, others are joining with a, a political science bias, some are joining with an engineering bias. And when I mean bias, I mean background, obviously. Uh, and, and we'll try and get everyone at least uh, on a level playing field when it comes to understanding what's happening on this planet, uh, on the sustainability side, even though obviously it's going to take the whole year to get everyone up to speed. Um, and then the T1, October, December, it's mainly about two objectives. The first one, uh, it's about impact assessment. I mentioned it in the, in the, um, in the masterclass, uh, sustainability leader is going to be imposing his vision, his or, her, his or her vision, if they manage to assess and measure the impact of their projects and their, their endeavors. Uh, impact assessment is becoming the holy grail of sustainability. How do you measure your social, how do you measure your environmental footprint? Um, uh, we're actually trying to make sure that this course can become uh, more and more widespread within the whole of ESSEC, not just in this program, uh, but obviously uh, this program is, is, uh, is where we're, we're giving it first. Um, and on the other side, we have management fundamentals augmented with sustainability. Um, for instance, this year's uh, class, we had about 60% of students coming from a business background. But it doesn't mean, it's not because you come from a business background, for instance, you've worked in marketing, you've studied marketing, that you, um, that you are solid enough when it comes to accounting and reporting, that you're solid enough when it comes to regulation and justice, right? And also we have the other half of the class, or 40% that actually don't come from a, a management background, and we need to uh, obviously uh, get them up to speed there. So the challenge of these courses, responsible marketing uh, being one that I teach, um, the challenge of these courses um, is to both get everyone up to speed with the basics of marketing, finance, accounting and reporting, performance, uh, management control, um, law, supply chain, strategy, but also making sure that those who already master these topics, uh, these, these bases, can, can go through them very quickly uh, and, and, and and actually come back when we actually augment these topics with sustainability, right? You've been studying marketing and you worked in marketing for a few years. Believe me, I've been teaching digital marketing strategy for 10 years and I wanna start creating my responsible marketing class course. It's, it has almost nothing to do with it. Uh, doing responsible marketing, it's a whole new approach to marketing. And so as a marketer, you're going to be learning a lot. You're going to be hopefully excited at discovering a new approach, which uh, in the case of some marketers, uh, you may have experimented already. 
Uh, the same goes with sustainable finance uh, and, and so on. We also offer the option to do a French language course uh, on a weekly basis for non-French speakers. Uh, we had different levels of uh, French courses. So your level is going to be tested at the beginning of the year. Um, and then you'll have, a, it's not mandatory, but it's a plus that we're offering. Um, we know that for a lot of you, I mean, this, if you're choosing France and a business school in France, it's not just because of the rankings, uh, it's also for the culture um, and for Europe that you might be interested in joining us. Um, and so we want to make sure that uh, you, you have the, the possibility to learn French. Then we move on to the T2. And T2, after we've got everyone up to speed, we understood impact assessment and measurement. Um, it's, it's really about learning about transformative frameworks. It's really about what is sustainability transformation, which again, is quite a new topic. We were very happy to see that uh, there are three other master's program. After we launched this program, there are three other master's programs that actually adopted a similar, either the same name or similar names, because this topic of stinty transformation is going to be spreading semantically, you know, as, 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 as the same way digital transformation has been uh, spreading 10 years ago. But what does it mean exactly? And, and it means that um, you need to, to, uh, you need to understand transformation through di three different levels. The first layer, first level, is how do you actually convince individuals and groups of individuals to shift, right? And for this, we've created one of the courses that is exciting me the most, uh, whose name will actually change. Apologies, you need to change the name of this slide. Uh, it's called From um, Inner Transition to Collective Change. Right? It's giving you all these tools uh, from eco-psychology um, to understand where you are, how you can shift yourself, how you can start shifting other people, and then facilitation tools. Uh, how do you actually move groups of people, right? Understanding what are the key obstacles to, to a sustainable world, and how do you actually move, uh, start shifting, start moving groups of people. The ultimate goal, the ultimate case study is, uh, you have uh, an XCOM within your company that is really reluctant to implement a stability strategy and you have to start convincing them. The second layer um, is strategy and business models. I mentioned earlier, I concluded my master class with the fact that a sustainability leader uh, will have to be able to go as far as imagining that potentially they will have to close their company, right? Uh, I'm not saying it has to be the case all the time, but they have to be agile enough and honest enough with themselves to go that far. Um, Building a sustainability strategy and, and imagining new business models uh, is, is absolutely key. And again, uh, hopefully uh, something that you can imagine how exciting it would be uh, from future uh, managers and, and leaders. And then once you've agreed on your strategy and your new strategy, how do you actually operate change management over years? Right? It, 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 building a strategy and imagining new business models is one thing. How do you, how do you make it factual um, is, is a whole other game. T2 is also about getting into one of the six majors that we offer. Uh, so it's up to you to choose uh, a major when you apply. These are the six majors that we offer. And when you apply to the MSc, you need to pick choice number one of major and choice number two. The, the four the six majors are built upon existing chairs of the SEC business schools, uh, learning chairs. Uh, these chairs have been built with partners, uh, corporate partners in a lot of, uh, in a lot of cases, uh, some of which we could actually add to the slide. Uh, there are new ones that just uh, signed up with us. Um, the first one is around circular economy. In the interest of time, I'm not going to be, um, to be giving too much detail on this, uh, but if you do have questions, you can reach out to us uh, to better understand what, what is behind each chair. Uh, circular economy is, is about uh, changing our economical, uh, our economy, uh, economical models uh, within our societies, within our organizations, from uh, a model that has been linear uh, for decades to a model that actually works, functions as a loop and, and has as little uh, inputs and wastage and use of resources as possible. 
one of the statistics that we hear uh, here and there is that um, right now our economy is about, if I reckon well, about 8% circular. Um, and if we double that figure, if we get to an economy, a global economy that is 17% circular, we should be able to solve um, to solve a climate change issues, right? Because you know this is this is how uh, key circular economy and circularizing our our supply chain and model and the way we communicate about uh, consumption uh, can be completely different topic, and yet absolutely key to sustainability is diversity and inclusion. This is a chair that has existed for 10 years at ESSEC. Um, this is a topic I was very new to a few months ago. I learned a lot about uh, with great uh, interest and I would even say passion. Um, one thing I'll mention here is that uh, ESSEC created uh, through this chair uh, a pedagogical tool called uh, the Diversity Fresk, which is starting to, to, to boom uh, with the organization. It's a three hour um, it's a three hour uh, exercise um, um, workshop that more and more companies are taking to um, and actually uh, that you'll be doing uh, at ESSEC as well um, to help you realize, you know, the, the, the intricacies and the complexity um, of, of um, and the richness, I would say, of, um, of employee management within an organization. And it's, um, again, it's something I highly encourage some of you who are interested in, in that topic to actually do if you, if you want to do the, the diversity fresh before joining um, joining ESSEC. Food transition, uh, I mentioned this was my uh, original topic that, that uh, got me into sustainability. Uh, major, major topic, uh, which is going to be uh, taking more and more space uh, in our lives as, as we, for instance, see with uh, the war in Ukraine and the lack of uh, wheat on the global market. Sustainable finance. Um, one word about this. I like to say that there will be no shift. There will be no transformation of our systems uh, without a transformation of finance. It has started. I feel it's still too slow. Maybe not always very authentic. And yet, if you manage to change the finance world, which is at the basis of everything we do, um, the rest should follow. Finance and regulation are going to be absolute, two absolute keys to shift our world towards sustainability. Climate and biodiversity, it's, uh, it's a major uh, that I'm in charge of uh, through a chair that I've launched uh, two years ago. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is that uh, for the last two chairs, climate and bio, the last two majors, climate and biodiversity and social innovation, uh, we require a certain level of French. Uh, because a lot of the stakeholders, a lot of the guest speakers are not uh, fluent enough in English. Unfortunately, it's going to shift progressively, but uh, the experience is still um, is still happening in, in, in French. Um, climate and biodiversity, I'm not going to dwell on this, uh, um, on climate. Biodiversity is the next huge topic that is coming up. And in a way, it is even bigger and even... Um, even bigger a cause and even worse the situation. Uh, sorry to put some joy into this, into this webinar, but that's the reality. And working on this uh, is, is going to become uh, vital for a lot of organizations who have an impact in biodiversity. And finally, social innovation that you can see on the number of chair partners. This uh, is the chair that has existed for the longest um, at ESSEC for 20 years now. ESSEC has been one of the, um, academic uh, pioneers around social innovation and, 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 and measuring the impact, uh, uh, your social impact as a, as a company. Uh, so very, very interesting uh, program as well. Social innovation, don't understand it just as, um, as, a, as social, but also as societal for the French speaking uh, people here. Social in English, it's really about society. It's about humans and it's about society. So it's really, a, it's really about, about both. Finally, the third term, the, the third trimester, uh, this is where we're going to be uh, going into, um, into different learning expeditions. We're going to experience things on the ground. I mentioned three learning expeditions. There's one learning expedition that you're going to be doing with your major, with your chair. 
And there are two learning expeditions you'll be doing with the rest of the uh, MSc students. Uh, this year, we're going to Provence, so the discover the sustainability ecosystem in the south of France, uh, which is both a way to uh, uh, completely change landscape, you know, especially in the middle of winter uh, for students, uh, you know, spending their lives in, 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 um, in, in Sergi and in Paris. Uh, the south of France is going to be uh, bringing a, uh, a bit of sun, uh, but also to limit our carbon footprint. You know, uh, it's, 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 it's the right distance, you know, to change landscape and not going too far and have a, a um, too, bad a, too bad of an impact. Um, the other learning expedition that we're organizing is closing the year. Uh, it is at the transition campus. That's the castle picture that you see here. Um, and what's, what's very interesting about this, this, uh, campus uh, that has been partnering with ESSEC for a few years now is that they're really, really strong on uh, education, especially when it comes to what we call frugality so, uh, or, or uh, sufficiency, uh, uh, as the um, IPCC has been calling it. So sobriété, uh, as it's called in French, not so much in English. Um, they live under the constraints of the Paris Agreement at two tons of CO2 per year. Uh, they're trying to limit their uh, impact on, on, on living, on biodiversity, on, on water and, 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 and wood and so on. They work with a lot of stakeholders around uh, the castle and the city. And also they are the forefront, I would say, of sustainability education uh, in France and more and more uh, in Europe uh, with a lot of the frameworks and research that they're developing. Um, spending two weeks there um, is uh, a great experience for students to, uh, to undergo life under the you know, strong sustainability constraints that also work on a very exciting and inspiring uh, project that are happening at the transition campus. The T3 is also the moment where we're going to be deep diving into some thematic courses um, around clean tech. Uh, there's also one very interesting experience is for students to manage their own course. Uh, don't worry, I'm, I'm, I'm behind it. So it's not like they're doing everything they want, but um, it's also for students to realize that they're going to have to, to educate people around sustainability in the coming years and decades, and uh, it's tough. Um, and finally, this ends with a professional uh, experience of four to six months in order to get your degree. There are a lot of student clubs at ESSEC. Uh, when I was a student there, I don't think any of these existed, and they really popped up uh, in the last few years. There's a... Um, uh, consultancy uh, around sustainability 180 degree consulting. Uh, there are, you know, uh, there are student clubs around uh, uh, raising awareness on climate change, on, on, on gender equality, uh, Enactus, which is also um, uh, around entrepreneurship, uh, sustainability entrepreneurship, which uh, is a global movement, and so on and so forth. I mentioned the two main roles that this program is destining you to. I would say sustainability consultant is the first one and joining an impact team or sustainability team in, a, in an organization would be the, the second one. What we also uh, striving is to make sure that because it is a new topic and even though the market demand is booming for this type of talent, we've imagined uh, a very, um, a very um, customized type of uh, accompaniment for the students. Uh, there's um, individual coaching uh, for the students of this program. There's peer-to-peer -peer coaching. There are two job fairs that are happening around impact jobs. Um, it's the third year that we're going to organize that. Um, so there's, there's a flurry of, of possibilities to, to, uh, to imagine your career and you have a full year of accompaniment to, uh, to build your own sustainability career. Um, one last, being conscious of time, we have a few minutes. And guys, don't hesitate to ask questions if you have any uh, already in the chat. Um, I'd be happy to you know, have a look at them immediately. The, um, the last few things is about uh, the network that you'll be joining. There's a very strong and interesting um, network called ISEC Transition Alumni of uh, close to a thousand, or a little more than a thousand members that was created three years ago. We're talking about talents um, from all around the world that are excited 
about sustainability that already work in sustainability for the majority of them, or that are shifting uh, their career towards sustainability, and that have been helping us build this program and that could actually help you build uh, your career. Uh, the chairs that also uh, this program is relying upon has a lot of alumni. Also, you'll be joining the, the wider alumni network of ESSEC, uh, which is uh, 65,000 uh, strong. We have two incubators, uh, one for early stage startups, uh, actually um, uh, Content Square, the scale up that I mentioned earlier, actually stemming from ESSEC Ventures, one of the largest scale ups in Europe now. Uh, but also Entropia, which is the social and environmental accelerator uh, of the school, whose reputation actually uh, spans much beyond the, the walls of the school uh, in France. So who can apply? We need four years of experience, right? It's then M2. It's the second year of a master's program that you'd be joining. And so we need you to have at least a master's degree or four years of bachelor. Exceptionally, uh, we have a quota of uh, applicants that we can take with only a three-year bachelor if they worked at least five years, uh, not including internships, right? It needs to be like five years beyond internships, right? Uh, so th that these are the, the, the requirements. And then in terms of horizons, we're looking to hire the most diverse uh, class as possible. We have 70 nationality for this year's class, for instance. Uh, I would say half uh, are French, half of are non-French, um, which is, you know, an inch, I think a, a nice balance. Uh, half are, uh, or a little more than half of the business background, less than half don't have a business background. I mentioned uh, political sciences, engineering, pharmaceutical, uh, and so on. As long as you're able to prove your interest for sustainability, um, as long as you're, um, you have a strong critical thinking, um, and as long as you had uh, good grades coming from a, a good university, a good program, um, you, have your, you, you can have a seat in our, in our program. Uh, I mean, we're especially uh, cautious also at the complementarity between the profiles and making sure that, you know, uh, it's not just a diversity of nationalities, it's also a diversity of personalities. Uh, it's a diversity of, of biases towards a sustainability. Some of the students are uh, eco-warriors who are some of the students actually uh, have been working for a few years in a large company and decided to leave their company because they wanted to get a training, but they're not eco warriors at all, right? They're like they're, their vision is more like, okay, I, I need to get like a, a proper rational training to get back in my company and change things. Um, we're also looking for diversity in terms of age. Uh, our youngest this year is 21, our, our eldest is 33, right? So we're open to, uh, to mixing up uh, different types of experiences as long as we feel through your CV, your motivational letters, your essays, uh, there's no motivational letter, there are lots of essays to write, uh, your references um, and the potential interviews that you're going to go through, which is not mandatory, um, that we can feel that you can bring something to the table and to the, to the group. The deadline, and I'm right on the clock, it's 59. The deadline for the first batch of application this year is October 18. So keep that in mind. Uh, you'll have quite a few essays to write. You'll have, you need to pick, depending on the majors that you will pick, uh, actually you'll have uh, different essays. Um, and you will also have to, um, to pick, uh, to come up with two reference letters. Uh, so ideally we're looking for someone from a, from, a, from a business experience and someone from an academic experience. Uh, it always, it always you know, show uh, different perspectives on, on who you are. Um, and I think that's it. I'm not seeing any questions. So hopefully that means that it was all, it was all crystal clear. Maybe we can give like a minute, extra minute for questions, but. Prof, the questions are in the chat. There are questions on the chat? Oh, so we, oh, thank you. Uh, I thought it was in the Q&R panel. Um, and Schumann, you, you, yeah, thank you for joining us. Uh, so Louise, we had, uh, we have 37 students this year. We're looking to get a little more than, maybe we'll get to 40, 45 next year. 
it's it's a program that will grow within a sec, right? The the vision within the next five years is probably like 100 students over two years M1 and M2. Right now, it's only the M2, and we're we're going to be between 40 and 50, which is a nice size for a group, I feel. Sure. What is the exact date for the first deadline? Okay, you got the answer. Okay, I missed all the questions. I thought I was on the right, I was on the wrong panel. Okay, let's take a few more minutes. Is the MSC eligible to uh, Air 2 in the France Région Subvention? Ah, that's a great question. Can you, I, I don't know, to be honest. Um, I don't see, I don't, if other programs are, I don't see why it wouldn't be, but I may be totally wrong. Um, could you please reach out to, because I'm not, I'm not in charge of, of um, you know, the, uh, all the, 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 the scholarship complexity. Um, could you actually ask the question by email to our recruiters and, and they'll, they'll, they'll let you know whether it's the case or not. I haven't mentioned uh, scholarships. We have, we doubled the number of scholarships compared to other programs uh, last year because we want to put our money where our mouth is. As I mentioned, this is a sustainability uh, program and we want it to be diverse and inclusive. Uh, and so we have a certain number of, of scholarships that we, that we give away on excellence and on, on diversity. Uh, that said, it remains a business school. The tuition fees are high. I don't think they're higher than any other creditors, but they are high. We do understand that. So obviously, if you need information on how to get other types of, uh, of scholarships or how to get an, a loan uh, within a French bank, for instance, even if you're not French, uh, these are the type of things that we can help you with. Does the contact form on the website work? I've sent two forms. It's been months with no reply. That's absolutely not normal. <laughs> Uh, and this, this, this is, uh, uh, this is alarming. Uh, and I'll be, uh, again, I'm, I'm not bragging, but one of the teams that I'm always impressed at is the recruitment team at ISEC. I feel like one of the reasons the school is, is working, is functioning so well. So this is adult, this is adults, Ivona, this is adults with what I've experienced. Um, feel free to join me on LinkedIn, um, you know, if that helps. Uh, please don't abuse it. Maybe I shouldn't be saying that because I could get like tons of messages. But if you have specific questions, I'm happy to answer uh, as many as I can. But obviously, we have trained recruiters uh, who have extensive knowledge on, on the program. So I would urge you to, you know, maybe write a third time. And um, maybe it was the summer. Maybe you wrote during the summer. The school was closed for three weeks. Um, so please, please do write a third time, and uh, and if you have a specific question, feel free to join me on LinkedIn. So still, Ivona, on the website you write that you only accept students with a four-year bachelor with five years of work experience. So five years of work experience, that's what we ask if you only have a three-year bachelor. My bachelor was three years and I have about one year of work experience. So no, I mean, it's not a matter of chances of being accepted. We can't accept you. This, these are like strict, uh, strict rules, uh, which, have, which we have to abide to. Um, so, and, and, and this, is, uh, this is about um, regulation of education. We can't just uh, make up rules and then, and then build exceptions. Uh, the, the accreditation that we got and, and is, is allowing us for uh, an exception of 40% of students with only a three-year bachelor, but they need to have at least five years of work experience on top of internships, right? So if it's not your case, I would urge you to wait a little bit more uh, or you'll have to actually do a, another program and maybe join us after that once you have a fourth year of, uh, of experience. So, so sorry about that. So uh, studying part-time, so uh, apprenticeship, alternance in French, unfortunately we don't offer that. The program is quite uh, intensive. Uh, and so we decided to, uh, to not do it, at least not for now. Maybe we'll think about a way to make it possible in the next few years. We know how critical it can be to be able to do an apprenticeship uh, in parallel to your studies uh, to get your tuition fees paid and to acquire experience. But it, it's a whole other uh, game when it comes to, uh, to logistics and, and planning. Uh, right now, we've come up with a very dense and intensive one-year program. 
Is there any housing on the campus? That's a good question. There is housing on the campus, but you have to start early uh, to get one. Um, the culture at ESSEC is more around, I mean, there, there is housing. Um, there's close housing, there's slightly less close housing. Um, the culture at ESSEC is more that of an open campus. You're in the middle of a large, uh, a large one of the largest suburban cities of Paris. Uh, in the outskirts of Paris, uh, a lot of students actually uh, become, uh, they take an apartment and they become roommates. Uh, that's what we have. We have, in this year's class, we have a, a group of five that are roommates, for instance, uh, in Sergi. Um, anyway, so that, that's more the culture of the school, but yes, there is housing and it's something you should ask about uh, early on, um, once, if and once you get accepted. What is special about the Provence Sustainable Ecosystem? Is it a particularly advanced region in terms of sustainability? Um, it is a very interesting region when it comes to sustainability uh, um, on the sea side, I would say, because uh, we have um, we have the sea thing, uh, we have the sea here. The other reason, and I just gave it away, is that uh, this is my region, and I have extensive knowledge of uh, of the that ecosystem. Um, the other reason, as I mentioned, is that uh, it's uh, it's a way to, uh, to change horizons in the middle of the winter without having to fly to the other side of the world. Uh, Cause it's a, it's a complete, completely different biotop and, 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 and vibe uh, in the South of France as it is in, uh, compared to the North. You just said a student had to choose a first choice and second choice of major. What defines which major students have in the end? That's a good question. So again, and, and apologies that uh, we're getting over time on this. So going back to the majors, uh, and I do realize I think I had a meeting and I'm, I'm late, so I'm gonna need to leave in a sec, but um, that's me not managing my time properly. Um, the thing about the majors is that uh, you pick majors, you, in some cases, we feel that you're not, your profile is not relevant for this major. For instance, if you want to apply to the sustainable finance major, you'll have to have very solid grades in finance before, right? And we have a lot of application that don't meet that criteria. And, and so we have to, 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 to gear them towards the second choice if, if we consider that the application is still solid enough. So it's a case by case situation. And in the end, you'll be, if you get accepted, you'll be uh, accepted with a specific major. And uh, it's gonna be up to you to decide whether you want to join us or not. So climate and biodiversity is obviously uh, taught through the program because it's a generalist program. But if you want to specialize on climate and biodiversity, it's taught in French, unfortunately. Right? It's going to change soon, but for now, the expertise that we give on this is in French. It doesn't mean that you won't have enough knowledge on this, that you're going to learn through a lot of different courses, impact assessments, that you're going to be learning through, for instance, the circular economy, uh, major, but if you're really looking to become like a, a climate footprint expert in understanding, uh, uh, you know, the complexity of the stakes on biodiversity, um, that's the climate and biodiversity major, which is in, in French. I think I covered all questions. Uh, if you, let me see, I have to choose the first choice. No, we got that. So the program is from uh, late August to uh, end of December the following year, internship included. I think I answered all of the other questions. So uh, Ramesh, I think your, your profile is fine in terms of requirements. All right, so apologies for taking two, 10 extra minutes. I hadn't seen the questions before. For some reason, uh, there was no notification on the chat panel on my side. Uh, don't hesitate to reach out to our recruiters. Uh, don't hesitate to invite me on LinkedIn, but don't abuse uh, chat on LinkedIn. I may not have time to answer everything. Um, and without further ado, I will, um, I will close this, uh, this uh, webinar and this masterclass and maybe see or hear from some of you in the coming weeks or months.